let me introduce our guest for you. Uh, she is a graduate of this university twice. Okay, she has a master's and a doctorate from our Cook School of Intercultural Studies. She's been a missionary for 32 years. She's an artist and a mentor and a spiritual mentor to artists all over Europe and in the, in the city of Charlotte, especially these days. Um, and she's also going to be our speaker at the Calvary Chapel dedication right after this chapel. She's also written this book, I Choose to Forgive. The expanded edition came out two weeks ago, and we're going to unpack this today. Help me welcome Dr. Diane Collard. Actually, before we begin, I just want to give you guys a warning. Some of what we're going to talk about is pretty heavy, and if somebody is triggering in you, feel free to go to the lobby. We have a pastoral caregiver in the back. So, Diane, yes. you know, some of us have that one day where things just change in our lives. Can you tell us about your one day? Well, you know, ours was one phone call. Yeah. We were missionaries living in Vienna, working with the former communist countries, and received one phone call telling us that our eldest son in Northern California, who was going to school and working, had been brutally murdered during the night. It changed our lives forever. Well, tell us more about that. How, what was the aftermath for you and your family, your, your husband, Glenn, who's with us today? You know, we learned a lot about grief. We learned that it's very individual. Mm. Everybody, even though we were all in the family grieving together, we did it in very different ways and we had to give each other space. I went into deep, total despair, mm. darkness. It affected me psychologically. I could not do anything sequentially. Um, I, color, light, movement, everything that usually is filtered in your brain, the filter was gone for a period of time. Um, I, I was in complete and total despair. My husband, longtime pastor, missionary, dealt with for the first time in his life, overwhelming feelings of desire to take revenge, to kill another person. He didn't know he had that possibility. Wow. Our daughter, who was in Northern California, took the brunt of hearing about Tim, seeing the body on TV, um, having to tell us, experienced post-traumatic stress disorder for seven years wow. following. So it affected each one of us very differently. In your journey, Diane, like what, was, what was most surprising, or what were some of the obstacles for you in grief? Well, the most surprising is how God worked to, to bring me out of this total despair. Mm. I had no background in art. And yet, one day we, I received a, a photograph of Tim's memorial stone that had been placed on his grave. And I shattered. Mm. I mean, I knew he was dead. I was in deep grief, but I completely was crushed. So I got in the, the uh, thought, I can't stay in the flat. So I got out, I went on the public transportation down to the, the first district of Vienna and started walking. That ultimately led to me finding solace in the Kunsthistorische Art Museum just because I could get out of the snow because mm -hmm. I needed a place to go. And God in his wisdom first brought me to paintings of, of destruction and war because yeah. it mirrored what was on, going on inside me. Yeah, yeah. Then it was paintings of the passion of Christ, mm -hmm. but not just Christ on the cross. It was paintings with his mother Mary. Mm. And I identified, I wept with this mother who had watched her son be murdered. Mm. Eventually, in God's sovereignty, he led me to, it's a longer story, I'm going to shorten it, to the Modern Art Museum. Now, I had been brought up in a very fundamentalist home that said that modern art, especially abstract art, was godless and anarchy and that Christians couldn't be a part of it. And yet I found myself here and God spoke into my heart. I can't explain it. All I only know he did. I can mm. describe it that God was the original abstract artist. Everything created in creation came from his imagination. Yeah. And just as he took those pieces of line, color, design, space, texture that I saw on the wall of the, with the abstract art, he could take the broken pieces of my heart and make something beautiful. And that 
in the worship of my God, not the art, in the worship of my God, my healing began. Mm. And before I left that art gallery, I heard again, Lord say, Diana, I have a new calling for you. I want you to find and encourage artists. And I said, Lord, I don't know any artists. <laughs> and I don't know why they need to be encouraged. And I don't know how to do it. But for the last 26 years, I have been working out that, that calling. Ultimately, in order to understand why so many artists, especially in Europe, felt alienated from the church, my doctoral dissertation is a, is a qualitative missiology dis- doctorate to, to study why, what is the role of art today in the free churches of Europe. Thank you for sharing some of the healing inside, uh, that was going on inside of you. How, what was it like to walk through forgiveness and <laughs> walking through forgiveness of the murderer? I'd been a Christian a long time. I knew that God's word said I had to forgive. Not only forgive, but in Colossians 3 and Ephesians 4, it says I have to forgive just as God has given, forgiven me in Christ. Wow. Not deserving total and complete, unconditionally. My first prayer was just because I wanted to be obedient and I knew I needed God help, God's help to survive, was Lord make me willing to forgive. He answered that and led me step by step. Eventually, I thought I had done everything that, that would be expected by, of God, by God of me to forgive. Mm. But one day about four or five years after I started this forgiveness journey, he knocked me off my chair in my study with a verse, 1 Peter 3, 9. And it says, you're not to just not to return evil for evil or, or bad words against that person, but you, were to, you are called to give a blessing instead. Wow. And I said, God, you can't expect me to bless the man who killed my son. So I looked it up in the Greek as to what that blessing was, hoping I could somehow get out of this (laughs) command. And it says that I'm to speak well of or to the person. And I said, God, I can't speak well of Tim's murderer. At that moment, I never mentioned the man by name. He was a monster to me. Yeah. And I said, I can't speak well of him. But God very clearly said, Diane, you can speak well to him. You can tell him of me. And that began years of correspondence with the murderer of our son to tell him about the potential and the possibility of forgiveness in Christ. Tell us more about what it was like to interact with the murderer and what it was like to to speak with him and share God's love to him. I, as as the mother of the victim... In California, because he'd been uh, convicted and was in prison, I was not allowed to, to relate, to connect directly with the, uh, the prisoner for many years. They assume it's always going to be for a bad reason. Mm. But my brother, who is a pastor in Northern California, had the, the right as a chaplain to go into the prison or to connect. And he found out where this person was in prison. He got permission to write him. And I would have to write my letters, give them to Bill, send them to Bill, and then Bill could, could send them on. This went on for years. Mm. Um, my first time to write him, I remember saying to God, God, if he de- tries to defend himself, I can't handle this. And God very clearly in my heart said, Diane, his response is not your responsibility. Mm. For g- obedience is. You obey me, I'll take care of this man. Over the years, eventually this man did come to Christ. So he's no longer a monster. He's my brother in Christ. Awesome. And we have worked to get him out of prison. He now lives here in the L.A. County, and he's trying to rebuild his life. Awesome, awesome. And you know, just to highlight this book again, his story is actually in this book. You first wrote this book, and it was your story, but this right. expanded edition has your, your husband's story, right. your daughter's story, and also his story yes. in all of that I'm process. so pleased. All right. Dan, we're going to unpack a few questions here. Okay. okay, here we go. Here's our first question. Almost there. 
All right. Well, let, let me ask you something, Diane. <laughs> Diane, you know, how long was the process of healing for you? Because it's easy to say, oh, I was healed and Jesus heals me. But what did, how long did that take for you? And how long was it even to forgive? You know, it was a process. It was cyclical in many ways. I would think I had done everything. You know, they talk about the steps of grief. And I thought, well, I've been through them. But then there was a deeper layer God wanted to heal. And mm. I would have to go back through that. The same thing happened with forgiveness. And that's why my book is I Choose to Forgive. Because I could at any moment, even today, choose to take up offense against this man. Because there's still hurt, there's still pain, there's still grief. Time periods are funny. I, I'll tell you this. It wasn't until my first forgiving was not based at all on feelings. I didn't feel any forgiveness. Yeah. But when I obeyed God and began to speak well to this man, to bless this man, God did that miraculous thing in that he brought my choice, my act of obedience, and my feelings together, and all bitterness, grief continued, but all bitterness and all hatred, all of those feelings God took away as I obeyed him. Wow. I just want to recognize how countercultural that is in our day and age. <laughs> I know. But for Christians, it should be our normal way of life. It mm. is what people walking in God's kingdom ought to just do automatically because we have known such a great forgiveness. Thank you. Thank you. Here's our first question How did your husband and daughter react to God's process of forgiving your son's murder? Very differently, very differently. In fact, I wish Glenn had time to speak because while I dealt with despair, he dealt with this anger, this desire to take revenge. Mm -hmm. and, and yet, he's a man of God, and he said, Diane, you do whatever God calls you to do. You are free to write this man. You're free to write this book. You're free to obey God. But I'm not there yet. Mm. I have to work it through. And our daughter, it took, like I say, seven years before the, the deep, deep binding of fear. She began. She got counseling. She ultimately, just to tell you the, kind of the end of the story, God changed my life and made me a creative catalyst, not an artist, but a creative <laughs> catalyst to assist and encourage other artists. But for her, she now is a counselor that is being used internationally to work with people and train people to work with people who've experienced trauma and, and all of that. God took something so painful and wow. has made something so beautiful wow. out of it. Thank you. Thank Only you. God. Only God. <laughs> Seriously. Okay. Here's another question. Does forgiveness always look like approaching the person you need to forgive? You know, God, I call this forgiveness, this doing a blessing acts of forgiveness. And it's different for every situation. Mm -hmm. It's not always appropriate to approach the person. You have to be obedient to what God's calling you. I think there's a misunderstanding inherent in this, that forgiveness and reconciliation are the same thing. Okay. They're not. Forgiveness is between myself and my God. Reconciliation requires both parties wanting a relationship. And if the person has not repented of their offense, if they've abused or whatever, and they are not trustworthy, God doesn't expect you to trust them. Yeah again. But he does call us to forgive because forgiveness is for our good, not theirs. Forgiveness is for us. If you understand the dangers of not forgiving, what, what it does to you spiritually, it says that we actually open our heart to the evil one to take up residence if we choose to not forgive. It affects us emotionally. It affects us even physically. Mm. And so God's command to, for, to forgive is because he loves me, and he knows it's best. Wow. Thank you. Thanks for saying that. Here's another question. Do you have any advice for someone going through the sudden, tragic loss mm. of a loved one and dealing with grief from that? My heart goes out to you. It's what happens. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I think it is important to have someone to talk with, whether it's a professional or it's a friend or it's a pastor. 
we did not have the privilege living in Austria to have the Compassionate Friends or any of these organizations, Grief Share. We didn't have any of that. So we, God had to supply it in other ways. Grief is incredibly isolating. And if mm. you do not reach out, it will cause you to shrivel up into yourself. So even it's hard, somebody you trust, start sharing it honestly. And that allow you to weep, allow you to yell if you need to, allow you to express those emotions. Mm. I love what you said. Grief is isolating. Oh. So just go and find somebody. Yeah, yeah. it is. It is. I didn't realize because I thought our whole family is going through this. Our daughter took a year, took her senior year out of college to come and live with us, so that the f four of us and our younger son could grieve together. But we weren't a lot of help to each other. We were in our own process, mm -hmm. and we had to learn to give space for that. Mm -hmm. Great. Here's another question, Diane. Uh, what have you found that artists have needed the most encouragement after being ignored by the church? I love this question because this is what my life is these days. Um, I found four reasons that the church today is still not embracing and encouraging artists. Number one is theological. I won't go into all the details of it, but it very definitely was an understanding of post-reformational theology. Number two was tradition. And their tradition was rooted in their theology. So those are kind of the same. Mm -hmm. The third reason that, that churches, pastors, weren't encouraging and embracing artists was that those that wanted to had no clue how to do it. They weren't schooled themselves. I think every, here I go, preaching, but I think every Bible college, every seminary ought to be teaching on what God's view of the arts and art artists are. I think it ought to be required because they didn't know how. The fourth reason was always interesting when I speak with artists because pastors of evangelical churches said, artists are problematic people and I don't know how to get along <laughs> with them. Um, I could unpack that more. I have found though that God is at work. In the last 20 years we have seen him quicken and call artists to serve him. The number one group of people committing to go to cross-cultural missions right now are, arts, are artistic people mm. of all the arts. God is at work calling forth an army of missionaries and Christians to, to bring glory to him in the kingdom through their artistic gift. So it's changing. Even the fact of this chapel that I'll speak in in a few minutes, mm -hmm. that chapel is a sign that it's changing and God is being listened to in the churches. Great, great. Here's another question. How do you talk to Christians who don't see the value of in modern or otherwise secular art forms? Oh my goodness, this could take forever. In fact, <laughs> I happen to have just finished a book on this topic on how if you don't get art, abstract art, and what happens if we don't understand it, we, we just vilify it or we reject it. Yeah. So hopefully by next year, the book probably called The uh, Original Abstract Artist will be out. Um, I think it's essential that they be willing to listen, to, to view modern art in a different way. I can't get this down to one sentence answer. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but but it is possible. I, I watched my husband who had no, he's a musician, but no artistic background. I took him to the Rothko room in the Phillips place, the Phillips Museum in Washington, DC. And you're surrounded by Rothko paintings that are nothing but color kind of hanging in space. And I said to him, just sit here and let God speak to you just show you the power of the color and what it is. And he came away a believer. So if he can do it, <laughs> I know the rest of them can. I wish I could go into more detail, but we don't have time. We, we can wait for your book. How's that? Yeah, okay. yeah. Watch for the book. <laughs> All right. Here's another question. What are some practical steps the church can take to better support our Christian artists? How can we adjust common Christian attitudes toward art today? Well, I think we need some education. We need to understand God's view of the arts, what God as the creator means for the arts to, to do and be. So uh, in Art Charlotte, we do three things. We encourage artists, we educate. Most of that is 
in the churches, and then we engage in the culture itself, because Art Charlotte is designed to nurture the soul of the city through the arts, so that's what we're doing. It takes education, it takes communication. Artists need to understand, oftentimes you do speak a different language and you walk, you know, you, beat, you follow a different drummer, and, and you need to be willing to explain. It takes pastors willing to, honor that the calling to be an artist is as godly and sacred a calling as the calling to be a pastor or a missionary. Because I don't think God has hierarchy in terms of his calling of serving him. That's right. And, and, but a lot of it comes down to education right now. Okay, okay. Here's another question. What are... And that's wait, it. didn't we just ask that question? Yeah. Okay, we did. Okay. Maybe that's it. <laughs> Well, here's my question then. Okay. Ready? Um, what What is it like to? Oh, here's here's a question. I'm, okay. I, I was just gonna make something up, but I couldn't think of something. Okay. Here we go. Here's a question. Okay. Can you talk more about how you have seen God work through art? What are some examples where you've seen Him do that? I work. Uh, I serve with Artists and Christian Testimony International. I'm the Europe director. My Europe director also includes Kazakhstan and Israel. Don't ask me how I got this region. Um, but there are artists of all kinds, F visual artists, classical musicians, uh, writers, every kind of the arts. And so God is using all of it. But what I'm seeing, especially with either music or the visual arts, is that it crosses culture. It crosses culture and allows for communication even when we don't speak the same language. And what happens is, once we cross the culture and we start building relationships, all ministry comes out of relationships. I believe that's how God's designed it. And art has that way of expressing. Also, I believe strongly that in, that in our country, as well as others, the, rec the reconciliation we all look for, for racial reconciliation and re relationship between s gender and all that, needs to start with lament. We need to name mm. our pain. And art is a beautiful way to express and name the pain of the past so that then we can come to talk about and look toward uh, reconciliation. Got a lot more, but we don't have time. For great, it. great. Here's another question. This is a really long one. Okay, here we go. What is the balance between forgiving someone and also condoning oh, yes. their actions? Where, when, how do I take a stand if they continue in the behavior, British behavior, I forgave them <laughs> for? For example, an alcoholic father yeah. abusing a child, how do you reconcile and approach that? Forgiveness and reconciliation are two different things. Forgiveness and trusting the person. Forgiveness and never says it's okay what they did. God does not look at us as sinners and say it really wasn't so bad what you did and I'll forgive you. He says you have completely, you are totally uh, committed to, to godlessness, but in my power I will forgive you. So he doesn't condone our actions ever. I think what we have to remember is that God also tells us to speak the truth in love. Mm. We are to confront sin. We are to take stands. But we also, in ourselves, between God and ourselves, are to choose to forgive. Those may seem antithetical. You cannot reconcile without forgiveness, but you, for, reconciliation does not always occur cannot always occur after. It may be that the person that abused you has already gone to heaven. You can't, you can't even confront them. You can't even tell them that you forgive them. Mm. I still think it's worth it to work through the process of writing the letter and stating it and then putting it in your Bible, what date you chose to do it and all that. But the truth is, forgiveness is an act between you and your God. Okay, thank you. Maybe one last question. How has understanding forgiveness the way God intended <laughs> transformed your life and the way you interact with others? Well, who wrote that? That's a great question. That's a great question. And it, you know, I need a seminar to answer it. Um, I think it's clear as I've, as I've expressed it that the, 
the obeying God to forgive. First of all, I knew that I wasn't going to survive without God's help. And I knew enough t- that without obeying God, I could not expect to have his strength and help and healing. And so it was almost a selfish thing that I had to go on this forgiveness journey because I wasn't going to make it. I didn't want to go on. So understanding God's forgiveness of me is where I had to start. Mm -hmm. And I had to go back to the word and look at what does it mean that God loves me unconditionally? What does it mean that he forgives me without me earning it? There's nothing I can do to earn his forgiveness. What does this mean? And then go to the scripture and we're told the word of forgive exactly as God has forgiven us in Christ. So that means I cannot expect this man to ask for forgiveness. Mm. I cannot expect this man, I can't wait till he changes his life for me to forgive. God wants to give you freedom. That's why this picture on the front of the book is, it's a a person who works with me in Art Charlotte, and the name of it is Set Free. That's what forgiveness does. Mm. Just as it brings freedom to be forgiven by God, as we obey him and forgive others, we are set free. And it's it's for freedom. And he wants us to live there. Awesome, awesome. Diane, one last question. Okay. And, what, and it's just to lay out some specific biblical principles, but what helped shape your thoughts for today? What happened to me after Tim's death was a, I was asking a question over and over and over again, I think a very normal one, and that is, why God did you allow it? Mm. We, were, we dedicated our kids to the Lord. We had prayed over them as we went to the mission field. We, you know... And yet God allowed him to be murdered. Mm-hmm. And, and one of the things that God asked of me in that process was to surrender the question why to him. Mm-hmm. He understands it, but he's chosen for us to surrender it to his sovereignty and his goodness and to trust him. And he gave me a new question, and it's what motivates my life. It's what, God, can you do with this horrible situation to bring glory to yourself and hope to other people? That is the motivation now of my life. Anytime I'm asked, I'm asked to come and speak at Biola, will it bring glory to God? Will it bring hope to other people? If it doesn't, then I'm not, that, I don't do it because God changed my motivation mm. in this process. Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.